us, please. So uh, thank you, Andrew, and hello to everyone. Um, I don't have a presentation. I have a few thoughts, and uh, forgive me, you sound a bit truncated. So um, uh, first, I also began gravitating towards Israel in the sense that I'm now writing a book about Israel and the United States in the 60s and 70s. And I'm beginning to get familiar with some of, the, of this history from the other side, from the demise of socialism in, in Israel, the 60s and 70s, and the rise of Israel as a consumerist society. Um, do I need to play into the group who is Anita Shapira, just as a preface to a, which is prominent Israeli historian. She wrote a number of books, uh, uh, most famously biographies, and I think the most uh, successful of them was the biography of Bell Katzenelson, who was the ideologue of the labor movement in the 20s and 30s. He was the first editor of Davar. Davar used to be the Easter Drew, the trade union's newspaper. It doesn't exist anymore, and, and, and uh, Katzenelson died in 1944. So I assume that a few of you, I see Maya, who I recognize as a compatriot of mine, but um, I'm, I'm, I just wonder if a few of you need some explanation about the terminology that she uses. Uh, revisionism, of course, means uh, right-wing revisionism. The history of Zionism, revisionism is exclusively right-wing. Uh, and Moshevot refers to late 19th century colonies, uh, the first Zionist settlements in, in, uh, in Palestine. And of course, Aliyah means immigration, Jewish immigration to, to Palestine, to Israel. Um, and perhaps I should say also something about myself. I mean, I, I'm, I'm not skeptical about this topic. I come from this background. So this, this is my family. This is the history of my family. My, my maternal grandfather was a socialist and a Zionist, and he came to Palestine in 1932, and he was an acolyte of David Ben Goyon, he admired him uh, throughout his life. He was a card carrying member of the Labour Party. Um, he wrote uh, letters to the editor of the VAR. He's, you know, I, I have great admiration for, for that generation and for that tradition. Uh, but I veered elsewhere politically, and I also see where this generation was wrong, both, both politically and, and even morally. Uh, and the irony of this, of dealing with this subject matter is that right now we are witnessing the demise and the total collapse of labor as a political movement. I mean, the last elections uh, in Israel, I think, proved that this particular tradition is no, is no base anymore in, in contemporary Israeli politics. So, so let me say something about the piece and about the topics. I think there are two narratives here. One is the rise of the labor movement uh, and its uh, hegemony in, 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 in Zionism and then in the state of Israel from 1930s to 1970s. And the other, which I think is as interesting, is the demise of the labor movement. It's a process that began uh, early on in the 1950s and accelerated in uh, the subsequent uh, decades, and then came to, I believe, a conclusion in 1990s. I think by the 1990s, this apparatus was no longer with us. Um, I also want to say, I think I would like to accentuate some points that, that uh, Anita Shapira makes along the way. I think that social design is, was, to a large extent, the most radical, the most messianic, but also the most exclusionary brand of Zionism. Um, uh, so, so socialism was conceived and practiced as a tool for mobilization uh, and was very effective that way. And, and, and socialist Zionism actually built the institutional and material infrastructure that allowed for Zionism to move to the state phase, to, to, to establish and then to maintain a state in the 1940s, 1950s. Uh, but at, at its inception, it was conceived as a tool of national regeneration that went much beyond the return to Zion to imagine a new and highly restructured Jewish society and a new uh, and rather masculine and close to the land Jewish man. So it participated in the new man discourse uh, that encompassed in the early parts of the 20th century Soviet communism and German fascism. 
I mean, I think the vision was to have a new kind of a subject position for Jews. Um, one lacuna in, in, uh, in uh, this article, and I'm sure that Omri would expand on this, is the way he treats the Palestinian question uh, and the question of, of, of Palestinian and Arab exclusion. And I think more than other, again, uh, permutation of Zionism, uh, labor Zionism was more adamant and more brutal about this exclusion. It also came with an argument that's an objective argument. We cannot uh, align with the Palestinian workers because they, are, they don't have the class consciousness that we have. They're not prepared for the, the, the class warfare that we have in mind. But it was also exclusionary towards um, a Jewish diasporic existence. He, he tried very hard and very violently sometimes to eradicate uh, uh, East European Jewish culture. And I think the, the most importantly, tried to suppress the use of Yiddish uh, in Palestine and then in Israel. Um, uh, okay, so and, and, and another point that I would like to make is that th there's something a very familiar in the demise of uh, the labor movement in Israel because there's a, a similar trajectory that can be discerned in, in Europe and perhaps elsewhere, but there are also some aspects that are sui generis. Uh, and I would like to focus on two institutions. One of them is the Istadrut, the general uh, trade unions, the other is the Kibbutzim. Uh, the Istadrut in many ways was a state before the state. A, a very powerful organization that was arranged as a state. It had its own judiciary, uh, legislature, and executive branches. It provided health care. And it also provided culture, uh, theater, newspapers, as I said before, um, youth movement that was attached to the Easter route, but also on uh, the largest corporation in Israel. Uh, called the Walker's Company, Chavat of Dim, um, and was the, one of the larger, the second largest employer in Israel uh, after the government. And so uh, working for a, a factory in, in, that belonged to the Institute did not give workers any privilege whatsoever because the argument was that we need to compete in the open market with the private sector. And therefore, be, you know, walking for the Istadrut didn't mean that you got, you know, a higher salary or any other advantage. Um, and I think by the, by the 50s and 60s, uh, early on, it was considered to be, you know, an institution of privilege. And the same is true of Kibbutzim. And the Kibbutzim, for the longest time, until the, you know, the rise of the right in the late 1970s, in, enjoyed privileges in terms of, of credit, um, government policy, um, distribution of other resources. I think that created, first of all, a hierarchy between the old socialist elite, this hegemony, and newcomers. Uh, so Israel in 1948, uh, at its birth, had 650,000 Jews. So within a year, it, it absorbed another million, within the 10 years, it absorbed another million immigrants. Uh, many of them did not have the same kind of ideological uh, loyalties and affiliations. Many of them did not come from East Europe, but from the Middle East or North Africa. A and for them, and that was used very, very effectively by the right, the Istadut and even most of the kibbutzim stood for Ashkenazi, particularly as a privilege. Um, Kibbutzim also be began to uh, employ uh, day laborers and, and other uh, sort of labor. So, so a hierarchy was created between those organizations and the rest of Israeli society. And I think the interesting aspect here is that socialism, if, if that's the right uh, for this hegemony, actually retarded the elaboration of the Israeli welfare state. Uh, so and, and the most obvious example is healthcare. So Israel national healthcare legislation came incredibly late. I think it was the turn of the 1990s. 
uh, when Israel had finally a nationwide legis legisl or legislation for a nationwide uh, uh, healthcare system, in part because the Histadrut had a monopoly, almost a monopoly on healthcare. And, and the, uh, the way it retained its membership, you had to, if you wanted access to what was the best healthcare system in the country, you had to pay dues to the Histadrut. So there was a vested interest for the Eastern route not to, to nationalize healthcare. And, and that, that, that is true of other aspects of welfare policy. So on the one hand, in the 50s, Israel society is rather egalitarian and there's a very advanced pro-labor legislation. But on the other hand, uh, there's really no welfare, uh, comprehensive welfare policy. Uh, throughout the 50s and the 60s, that changes with the right of the Israeli Black Panthers in 1971, when suddenly uh, budgets are found uh, to deal with uh, impoverished parts of the country, with individuals who cannot walk. Uh, and, and then even more so when the populist right came into power in the late 1970s, with a major, major project to uh, rehabilitate poor neighborhoods throughout the country. So I think I'll, I'll stop here and then circle back later on when we have a conversation uh, and allow Omri to uh, react. So thanks very much. Uh, we said Omri is going to be graciously commenting on this. And then uh, uh, even though I think there are people here who know more than me, aside from the two of you who of course do, um, I, I will be the third and say something after Omri. So Omri, please. Andrew, there is a certain joke, a Jewish joke that I cannot tell because I cannot remember at the moment. And it has to do with uh, people competing who's actually uh, smaller, you know? And uh, it becomes, you know, um, the competition who knows less becomes, you know, the greatest show showing off of, uh, you know, I don't know, I'm not an expert of this, I'm not an expert of that, someone knows more. So I have to start by saying I actually know very little on socialism, right? And um, that was uh, one reason for my reluctance to uh, to actually comment in a in a seminar like this um, um, as a, an alleged alleged uh, socialist. I do have a hobby in uh, uh, thinking about Zionism enough to speak about it a little bit, um, and it's related mostly to. Um, thinking about um, from the perspective not so much of history, even though that too, but uh, um, of uh, political philosophy or um, um, uh, political theory of thoughts, sometimes in relation to liberalism. So one thing that I can do in a second is to try to translate a little bit my uh, worries about, I mean, let's call it in its name, uh, my attack on liberal Zionism, as we know it. Um, um, try to at least uh, um, um, say a word of um, uh, translation to translate the problematics and the contradictions of liberal Zionism to the realm of the question of um, um, uh, socialist Zionism. And perhaps that's a way for the, for the ones here who know more about socialism, uh, um, addressing those uh, uh, contradictions and problems can be a way of thinking of uh, questions of socialism and uh, Zionist socialism. I can do this quickly in a second. All started with a personal, uh, uh, at least um, a personal state. I can, I guess, do the same. I'm also coming from a family, I guess, like so many other Israelis, um, um, a family that was uh, deeply socialist, um, um, not from uh, Mapai, but from Mapam. Um, um, both of my grandparents, uh, um, definitely the German ones, but not just them, um, um, were real um, Mapamniks. In fact, on the left of my of my palm, I would say, and I still remember my father, who's still, um, who's still a um, socialist of sorts, uh, even though his views have elaborate have, have developed like everybody. I still remember him hating the kibbutz. That's something interesting for the uh, for the um, Israelis here to, to to see that there were even strands. I think it is possibly a surprising fact. Um, that um, one could come uh, precisely in the name of um, a certain uh, socialist outlook to um, deeply oppose 
the kibbutz because of the way in which uh, the kibbutz uh, was an elitist, uh, anti-universalist in some ways. Definitely on the Arab or Palestinian question, uh, far from uh, um, perfect to say the least. Um, and um, for that reason, he always opposed it. I still remember my father sitting in a seminar, this will interest Andrew, a seminar by Thomas Poggi on political philosophy at Yale that I invited my, uh, my father. And I remember Thomas speaking about uh, the kibbutz and explaining its principles. And I remember my father whispering in my ears that you have to be a German romantic who loves the Jews too much in order to be so enthusiastic about the kibbutz. And, uh, so that's just uh, uh, one story. Um, the other side notes that I want to make, um, just relating that things that came up when Oz was speaking, and I want to just throw them, um, put them down before I forget, frankly, is um, Oz mentioned the, uh, the demise of the labor movement, and to that extent of a certain uh, demise of um, socialist Zionism, one can say, or of uh, at least the original project. And um, in some obvious ways, this is true. The Labour Party doesn't exist anymore as a relevant party. And obviously, this is a, um, an international trend of sorts. But um, um, again, the Israelis here would, I'm sure, uh, would be aware of the recent talk of uh, the joint list um, taking over um, somehow the future of uh, the Israeli left. And one thing that's very interesting in this phenomenon is that this is the leaders or the leader of this list is coming from Hadash. There, there is a certain way in which um, uh, the demise of the Zionist labor movement um, um, does make room to the emergence of not Zionist, we can speak about it, um, whether that's true or not in a second, but a different Israeli left, which actually is at least related, this is complicated, um, uh, um, to socialist thinking also. And it's interesting to think whether this is just a coincidence or not. And it's probably not, I'm not sure how to outline that um, in more detail. There was, another, there was another comment that I wanted to mention when Oz was speaking and that I'm blanking on. Uh, oh yeah, it was the comparison that I think Oz was making. He was speaking about um, the um, messianism even. I think you used this term Oz. Yes. Of the, um, of the um, uh, Zionists, um, of the socialist Zionists. And I thought that um, it was an interesting comment because it made me see something that may be obvious, since I'm really no expert on that. But uh, it made to me a very vivid an, um, a comparison between religious Zionists and socialist Zionists. Of course, I'm aware that all Zionists can be messianic in many ways and so forth. But um, there is something here about the way in which something that could have been uh, an end in itself, religion, you know, uh, I'm not a religious person, but uh, I take it for religious people, um, a certain type of religion needs to be conceived as an end in itself, but for religious Zionists, often, not always, often, is actually uh, becoming means to the end of uh, Zionist aspirations. Um, an example of this is, for example, the famous letter um, um, that Freud wrote, I don't remember whom now, where um, um, he was asked to support Zionist principles. And he said, you know, you guys obviously do the following. You try to, um, to bring religion in in order to make the people follow Zionism. I think it's a terrible idea uh, because um, it inverts, I mean, you will never be able in the end to control the religion that you're now using in order to, um, um, to sustain the Zionist cause. I now realize that, um, or at least begin to imagine that there are ways in which socialism functions in the same way. I think actually in the, the essay by Anita Shapira, we, um, we see that in some of the comments that Ben Gurion is making, and not only he. Um, there is a way in which socialism is is only used as a means to the end of Zionist um, aspirations, rather than as an end in itself. And the messianism that's involved in this uh, socialist trends um, then become really perverse, uh, um, possibly. That's one, uh, so those are two comments that I was thinking of when, when Oz was speaking. 
Um, my own take on um, the problematic of Zionist socialism can be formulated like this. We have um, a familiar concept of what liberal Zionism is supposed to be, and the problems with it and the alleged solutions to it are relatively familiar. Liberal Zionists claim that there is no contradiction in the notion of liberal Zionism because um, there is no contradiction between nation states and liberalism. A state specifically does not have to be neutral on the concept of, um, sorry, on the question of uh, nationhood or culture in order to be liberal. That's a, a familiar argument. And that's a way to uh, square um, the tension between a certain liberal perspective, which demands to achieve universalism through state neutrality, and um, uh, the question of liberal Zionism. And I take it that's, of course, the, um, um, that argument may be true. One can debate it. Um, I personally think it's not completely false. So um, I don't think that liberalism demands neutrality on the level of culture. I think that uh, a German state or an Italian state can be a liberal state, possibly. However, it's not obviously, um, uh, it does not apply to the question of a Jewish state. And the reason is that the Jewish people um, um, or the Jewish state and its relation to the Jewish people is conceived very differently from the way in which an Italian state understood it and understands its relation to the Italian people. Um, the Italian state um, is Italian, whereas the, Jew, the Israel is not an Israeli state. It is a Jewish state, and as such, it does not belong to all of its citizens. It, um, um, it does not express a sovereignty of its citizens as such. It expresses a sovereignty of the Jewish people. For that reason, a state cannot be both um, Jewish and liberal. Now, the question arises, how do we understand this in relation to socialism? Does socialism uh, um, require state neutrality? How do we understand the relation between socialism and universalism? Um, is it the case that um, somehow the socialist cause has to be universalist? If those answers are affirmative, and I take it they are, but the experts here will, tell, will talk to me more in a second. I mean, I, I'm aware of some of the literature, but the experts here will educate us all, I take it, on um, more of those questions. To the extent that socialism has to be to, uh, to strive one way or another to universalism, I take it um, the Zionist cause is inconsistent and cannot be made consistent with uh, um, core socialist principles because um, it necessarily goes against the demands of or the interests of the workers especially that the workers in Israel or in Palestine have always been predominantly uh, the Arabs. And post-67, um, they were, of course, always not even the citizens Arabs. Right? They were uh, the Palestinians coming from the occupied territories um, for a very long time. Um, so that's um, one um, way to formulate, I think, the, the question of socialist Zionism in an obvious way. I think it, uh, Anita Shapira's text is Obvious because, if I'm not mistaken, Oz tends to agree with me about this. Um, Anita Shapira speaks as a party uh, intellectual almost. She's uh, in some ways scholar, and I have uh, um, respect in some levels. You know, I don't think we need to. I uh, Oz mentioned this at some point that he has also a lot of respect and maybe even admiration to a certain generation of the state founders. I have I share that too. Um, but also uh, deep, deep criticism. I find Anita Shapira dangerous um, in some ways because she belongs to a project of um, certain state propaganda even, um, either um, um, consciously or not. And I'm not sure. And I think that that's a problem. I don't think that that problem needs to be now thematized here in this seminar. But I think that we see a lot of that. And we see different generations of that. Amos Oz was a, an example of such a, um, you know, uh, um, well, maybe if we speak of socialism, um, hegemony intellectual. 
and uh, so is Anita Shapira, um, uh, as a reader here. Uh, on the one hand, she makes some gestures of understanding the problematics of excluding the Arabs. On the other hand, when she speaks of walkers, she speaks almost exclusively on Jewish walkers. When she says that there is no working class or was no working class in Palestine, uh, she, she basically means um, uh, the Jews. Um, when she says that there was no nationalization of uh, what was it means of production, she obviously is not thinking of the fields of the Arab uh, uh, population that was expelled in the Nakba and was nationalized for uh, state uh, purposes. There are ways of thinking here, I think, um, that needs to be um, deeply questioned. Yeah, I have more to say, but I'll stop here also. This is, and uh, we can maybe, yeah, start a discussion. So, so let me say something about this topic. Now, uh, I've been to Israel maybe twice or three times, but for very short times. And uh, I certainly have, you know, I've written on all kinds of subjects, but I certainly have not written even one piece which touches on uh, on either Israeli society or uh, uh, or ideological issues or the Arab-Israeli uh, conflict. So I really am coming to this topic entirely from the outside. But as uh, all of you know, uh, for this course, we wanted to, I wanted to collect uh, uh, a sufficient uh, number of, of empirical uh, topics along also with a few purely theoretical ones. Uh, we'll be discussing just one book uh, uh, the next week with uh, Ms. Sanjay Reddy and, and, and you know, we, we do different things here. And I wanted to cast the net widely in terms of international, uh, uh, international experiments and problems. And, and in this sense, uh, certainly I thought intuitively that uh, Palestine, Israel uh, belong to the, uh, to the topic in a very, very broad sense. Uh, you know, it, it, I also try to have uh, presentations on Indian socialism, on Arab socialism, but it also it also depended on 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 where speakers were available, and sometimes the speaker was available, but did not want to talk about that topic, as in the case of Arab socialism. Uh, so, in any case, we have this topic, and the uh, and the two speakers are gracious enough to have accepted it, in whatever reservations they may have toward it, whatever relationship they have uh, to the topic. Now, socialism, in terms of the purposes of this seminar. Uh, is understood in a non-sectarian way, uh, which means that uh, that um, uh, we we have not for a moment, and none of us did for a moment, engage in the habit of denouncing people and groups and aspirations that call themselves socialist as not socialist at all. Uh, so, in this sense, uh, in this class, uh, in this seminar, uh, we have dealt with the Soviet experience and. Uh, and did not uh, uh, go with those who denounce it as nothing but totalitarian or state capitalist or whatever. And social democracy on the other side too, which uh, to lots of people in the Marxist tradition has nothing to do with, uh, with socialism. Social democracy too is part, uh, part of our, our topic here. And utopian socialism, so-called, that's a Marxist term, is part of the topic too. So a large variety of, of of, uh, of approaches, experiments, theories uh, belongs here. And of course, once you think of it this way, then the presence of Israel uh, makes a lot of sense. Now, I, I accept the criticisms of Omri of, uh, uh, of Shapira's uh, piece, which for me was informative, uh, by the way, because I know so little about the topic. But in any case, she does demonstrate that in terms of intellectual influences, discussions, uh, presences, socialism has been present both in the Yishuv, uh, in other words, mandatory Palestine, and in Israel after the formation of the state. And even now, Oz is of course right about the decline, but even now, of course, it is present in terms of, uh, of at least intellectuals, intellectual groupings and approaches. I'm just thinking, for example, my friend Yoav Pellet. Uh, who I'm sure is a very staunch 
socialist, and he's not entirely alone, uh, though I think he's feeling but, but more alone. He's not a Zionist. Uh, well, he's not a Zionist, but, uh, but I don't think the topic implied necessarily Zionism and socialism. Uh, of course, uh, immense majority of those, all of them discussed by Shapira, uh, because she pays almost no attention to the, to the critics of Zionism within Israel, Israel and Palestine. They are Zionists. Uh, and can I interrupt you just for a second uh, for a quick uh, uh, discla comment, disclaimer, uh, clarification? The, I, didn't, I, I, I think that the topic is an excellent one. I think uh, it's important to uh, include a conversation. No, no, no. I mean, it's not, I'm, I'm not saying all this in, in a defensive way, but I want to explain how uh, 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 we hit upon it. And, and, and look, uh, uh, when I suggested to the two of you that we could have topics here like uh, the cooperative movements uh, in, in Israeli labor, uh, we could have topics like the role of Hista Drood. Uh, uh, Oz has given some interesting clarifications now on the Israeli welfare state, which one tends to, if one was in the outside, always imagined that it was a fairly well-developed one uh, already in the Yeshuv, and certainly subsequently. Uh, in terms of my reading now, too, I see that even in the Yeshuv, there were two traditions, a very minimum form of state welfare and Hista Drood system, which was very developed, but it was developed within the exclusions uh, for that institution. So uh, in, in all these senses, uh, 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 we're talking about, uh, we're talking about a real topic, uh, but a series of topics. And I think uh, uh, the question, uh, uh, the two questions which, which, which we need to address is what is its role in the history, A, and B, what are the reasons for for the decline of that role, which is probably very, very radical. Uh, and, and the role, and I think in this sense, Oz is right in saying uh, that it has to be linked to Zionism because otherwise uh, yeah. socialism has no role, uh, uh, aside from a few sectarian individuals who happen to be there and who express their views. It is only in relationship to Zionism that is a fundamental role. And so then the question becomes, and since I was reading Shafir and Pellet today, I know what their answer to this is, is what is the relationship of these two uh, ideological frameworks, or rather uh, Zionism, which may be even a multiple, uh, a series of ideological frameworks. After all, you still have people like Buber and Arendt who are Zionists in some other way uh, than the other Zionists. So Zionisms in a plural and socialisms in a plural. And Shafir and Pallad basically answer uh, that it is a handmaiden of nationalism. That it, the fundamental thing is nationalism in Zionism. And to the extent that socialism is significant, it's always in reinforcing that project. And, and in that sense, even uh, uh, in the very early days, when there are battles between Israeli socialism and Israeli capitalism, which would be classical, right, for, for the socialist tradition to challenge private capitalism, even then it had to do with the issue, above all, of Arab labor, because of the Israeli capitalist utilization of Arab labor, which was inconsistent with the Zionist project. So that uh, the idea of fighting for labor, Jewish labor, such as it was, uh, uh, and it was coupled uh, uh, with, uh, with the struggle uh, for, uh, for hegemony within the land, for, for, for territorial uh, uh, control, and the exclusion, and the exclusion of the population, which at that time is numerically the majority one, uh, and has remained that uh, until the Nakba uh, in, in 48. So, so the argument would be, and I'll, I'll, I'll end with this very quickly. The argument would be that everything that Shapira mentions may be true. I don't know if Omri accepts that. I tended to think that basically uh, it's probably undeniable that Israeli socialists have been influenced by the Russian Revolution, that they've been influenced by Austro Marxism, that they have been influenced by British labor and the welfare state. So, in that sense, her description of the presence of these elements and even the strength of the cooperative movement, such as it was, is undeniable. But the question is, which Omri raised in email correspondence, 
is what is its role? And is its role entirely, and I'm not sure if this is even Pellet and Shafir's view, because I'm uh, presenting a kind of caricature version of their argument, that it is only function. It is only functional to, uh, to intensify the nationalist project, to intensify all this negative aspect. It's part of a colonial project. In fact, that's, the, mm -hmm. it, it, that's what they say. So, so my question is, and Oz is ready to jump in, my question is, can that, even, can that ever be so? Are ideological things so functional uh, that they are nothing else but their function? And do they really have genuine social consequences and significant uh, results independently of whatever that functional argument uh, rightly would claim? So that's the question I want to raise, is that if the presence is so significant, even if it has a functional dimension, is that all, does that exhaust it? Or is it really more than that? Oz, you're ready to jump in. Yeah, I'm, I'm, ready, I'm ready to jump in. And uh, Omri is a philosopher, uh, I'm a historian, and each of us have his own uh, disciplinary deformity. So I, I first and foremost think historically about some of those questions. And I think we, are, we tend to be presentists when we discuss some of those issues. And we are all one way or another, either participants or children of the new left and, and see the world through those, uh, the, the, that particular prism. So just to remind you is that uh, socialism at the end of the ninth century was Eurocentric, uh, was uh, racist, uh, and was complicit in the colonial project. And that's true of Marx, not just of uh, socialists, the communists, uh, and, and, and I don't know about anarchists, but certainly that was the case. When the First World War broke out, all socialist movements in Europe supported the war effort from a nationalist point of view. The only socialist party that opposed the war was the American Socialist Party. And, and, and then Eugene Debs had to spend some time in jail because of that. Uh, and I think the, the Zionist social was part of this trend. It was colonialist and racist and saw those people as transparent. They were not fully formed modern subjects. And in, in this sense was part of a much larger trend. Now, from our point of view, and I think you're right, and that's something I suggested, that at the end of the day, looking back a hundred years, it seems that socialism was an instrument um, and that became even more visible after 1948 in the 50s and 60s and decisions that were made about opening the Israeli economy to private capital, to a pluralist kind of a market uh, for all kinds of reasons, uh, largely national, the, the national welfare. Um, but I think from the point of view of 1910 or 1920, there was really no difference uh, between socialism and Zionism. And, and they took socialism seriously, and in part because they have a had a particular view of history. They thought the future belongs to socialism. Uh, that's the destiny of human society. And therefore, in order for the Jews to come back on the stage of history, and that was a term that uh, was used, they need to align themselves with modernity. And, and, and therefore, socialism was not just a kind of a decoration or an instrument for mobilization. It was part and parcel of this redeeming project for this particular group in nine, uh, 1920s, 1930s. I think the second generation, the people who grew up in the 40s and 50s, for me, the, the best example is Shimon Peres or Yitzhak Rabin. It, it's a, a, a generation of technocrats. Uh, for them, socialism was good up to a point, and uh, capitalism is as good in terms of uh, actually bringing results that are material. Uh, so I do think, uh, look, uh, uh, Anita Shapira is an intellectual historian, and she's a bit of a school mom in her approach to different individuals. I do think that the founding generation was very ideological and cared a lot about ideology. Uh, I think the second generation was very, very different. Can't hear you. I have a question though. I, I agree with you that the first generation of Zionist socialists was very serious about their socialism and how it is like interwoven into Zionism, like as a joint project. But this is like what, like 
I understand that they couldn't understand that what they're doing is also part of a colonial project, but, but they really ignored like the reality in which even in kibbutzim, Arab workers worked for the kibbutzim since the beginning, which the kibbutzim was like the narrative of like the self-made mm-hmm. men, the self-made Jew, the Jews of the muscles. So it's like, since even prior to the state, and then they had to have also Mizrahim, right? Like the first uh, immigration from uh, Yemenite Jews who worked in Kinneret. So they really, really thought they're socialist and their vision was like Zionist, but it was so, like so narrow, only to but, them, only to Ashkenazic Jews. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not going to justify that. I'm not going to be the Anita Shapira of this discussion. Um, there's no excuse. I'm just saying that this is actually maybe historically part and parcel of what socialism right. was in Europe, that it, was, it saw itself as being universalist, but in reality was not. So Oz, I, I, I was going to uh, try to answer it, exactly that answer um, in your name to Maya, mm-hmm. but still disagree with you, I think. Um, um, not to say that this is not an interesting and important uh, observation to say, look, uh, socialists were nationalists and racists and colonialists in those days. Um, but I was actually, in my point, I was trying to be slightly more refined. And I was trying to say, um, look, there is a, um, um, a difficult his- issue here with Zionism, which is not just reduced to the contradiction or not. By the way, because when I say contradiction or not, I mean, one could have devised maybe a wise dialectical argument, say, look, there is no, it's not a contradiction between the nation and the workers or the nation and universalism, but by some dialectical magic, um, we actually get to the progression towards, say, universalism um, um, through the nation state or something like that. So, that, you know, that's one way of maybe even, I don't know if justifying, explaining, understanding um, the possible, um, you know, um, um, the, the historical fact that you're stating that um, socialists were racists and nationalists and so forth. Absolutely. My, my point was actually to try and say, okay, what's the difference then still between um, the form of nationalism that Zionism is and um, Italian or German nationalism? Look, so my great uncle, uh, Ernesto Koch, the brother of my uh, uh, sister, he was a real German socialist. He, was, uh, um, he went to a, a concentration camp when he was 17. And um, very early on, I can't remember the year right now, as a socialist, as a German socialist, not as a Jew. Mm-hmm. At some point he was let out and as the Germans said, oh, well, now you can escape. If you leave the country, we'll let you go. And he left, he was in, in Yugoslavia. And he met there, there are the people from the kibbutz. And the people from the kibbutz told him to, uh, you know, come to us. He said, absolutely not, because you guys are racists. I'm a German socialist, and I believe in socialism. I think that this is just a, whatever, a personal historical anecdote. There is, a, there is an inherent important difference between Zionism as a national, forget nationalist, national ideology and um, or national identity even, forget ideology, and Italian identity, even in those days. Italian socialists could have Jews belong to them. Mm -hmm. Um, Zionist socialists could not have Arabs belonging to the Zionist cause. Not, and this is important, if the goal of Zionism is to establish a Jewish state. Um, For example, um, in fact, even if the goal of Zionism, and that's my next point, which I think is actually surprising and important here, um, not even if the end of Zionism is not the establishment of a Jewish state, but say the establishment of Jewish self-determination. Andrew mentioned the many Zionisms of Buber and Arendt and so forth. The interesting fact here is that a lot of the people we're talking about, you know, Anita Shapira is quoting Ben Gurion, I can't remember from, you know, from the 20s, from the early 30s. Those are days in which even Ben Gurion is not speaking of a sovereign Jewish state, but of um, um, a certain type of a federation um, with the Arabs. So that's, that's an interesting fact, and it could be used in order to make coherent um, 
socialist trends, if they do not depend on a Jewish state. Still, I take it, a non-Jew has no room within the Zionist construct, whatever it is, um, uh, for genuine, um, not collaboration with, but being a part of the Zionist cause in the same way in which my great uncle could be a German socialist. I know the ironies of saying this. Uh, we know how his parents ended up. Um, but being an Italian socialist, a French Look, socialist. I, I understand the, the point. I mean, I, I don't have uh, the aspiration of saving Zionism from itself. Uh, and perhaps it's not redeemable. Um, and, 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 but on the other hand, the truth is that I think for the longest time, I don't think there was any Arab that wanted to become a Zionist or want, wanted to participate in any of that. You mentioned Hadash, uh, which is, I think, the last bastion of socialism in Israeli politics, but it's a non-Zionist right. uh, uh, political party. And the question whether there could be a new national identity organized around Israeliness. Uh, rather than a, uh, around some uh, particularly Jewish uh, identity. But these, these, are sort of, these are, I think, questions that are outside the boundaries of this particular discussion. I just want to remind us for the longest time until I would say the 1970s, Israel for world socialism was an example. Yeah. Right? It was a paradigm. I remember I, that was the 1990s that uh, when Noam Chomsky was asked, where on earth? is your vision for anarcho-socialism implemented? He gave two examples. One was Catalonia in the late 1930s. And the other was the kibbutz. Right. And so, again, he was wrong. He was blind too, maybe. Um, but that was became, so Israel became for a while a paradigm. You know, Bernie Sanders worked as a volunteer in the kibbutz. Nancy Fraser worked as a volunteer in the kibbutz. Um, and I can give you. I can give That's you the most other. surprising. The other ones, the other ones, are, I'm not surprised at all. But with Nancy, I'm surprised that she would be blind. Well, I think they were all blind, and uh, and we see things that other that they didn't see, uh, all the way to the 60s and early 70s. I'm I'm aware and I agree about the obvious social. Something seemed such a great social experiment. And uh, um, um, obviously, but obviously wasn't. That's an interesting fact. Right. So the interesting thing about the kibbutzim is that, you know, many of them were privatized uh, beginning in the 1990s. The rich kibbutzim stayed collectivist. The poor kibbutzim privatized. Um, it's, it's a little bit counterintuitive. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm working on a, a research project right now um, about uh, well, it's just a, it's, I'm writing about a particular document, which is a pamphlet by Julius Brauntal, who was the, he was a high ranking official in the Socialist International, um, who was like a lifelong, he was Austrian, he was like Austrian Jewish, like lifelong socialist Zionist. And he wrote this pamphlet um, in 1958, it was published in 59 called The Significance of Israeli Socialism and the Arab-Israeli Dispute. Um, and like the foreword is by J.B. Kripalani, who was an Indian socialist. Um, and it, he basically makes the argument that um, nationalism made Israel, Israel's democratic socialism possible. Um, and then he like address, specifically addresses Arab socialists and says that their nationalism is getting in the way of socialism. Um, and what they have to do is, is stop um, opposing uh, the existence of Israel and to just like basically get along. Um, and yeah, I just like, I think it's very interesting to think about um, Israeli socialism's relationship to both like European socialism, but also Asian socialism and the extent to which like, like Kripalani tries to make this case that um, Israel's socialism is organized like along the same values that um, socialist, Indian socialists hold. Um, and like trying to, um, you know, Israel's Mapai's attempt to like be part of the Asian socialist conference 
uh, went very poorly <laughs> because the Arab socialists like walked out or prevented them from joining the gatherings. Uh, we talked at the beginning about like whoever calls themselves socialists gets to be recognized as socialists. And I think like the extent to which um, Israeli socialism was or was not recognized um, in this moment, which was also a moment of like massive decolonization and like con contestation over what self-determination would look like um, in, in the decolonizing world is a really interesting question. Well, if I could say something on, on this particular point, I, I was often struck by the similarities of, uh, of Indian and the Israeli moments of decolonization. And, uh, you know, you can certainly uh, see parallels between, uh, between Nehru and Ben-Gurion in, uh, in their relationship to, uh, uh, to uh, independence and in the relationship also to, uh, uh, to uh, uh, the kind of uh, society that, that they at least imagined for a moment. Uh, yet in the Indian case, uh, uh, now of course you can say the partition and you can say the atrocities against Muslim uh, uh, parts of the population, but I think it is certainly fair to say that the, uh, the leadership of Congress was not for expulsion. Uh, so if you compare them in 1948, uh, they uh, continue to believe in a, a multinational India because even to speak about two in India is a, uh, an abstraction. There are many nations, but there are two major religious uh, clusters and, and the leadership of Congress wanted uh, uh, certainly to create a society on the basis of both. And indeed they had it within their leadership even uh, some important Muslim uh, uh, figures like Azad was was uh, was one within the very top leadership of Congress, and this you don't see in at that moment. Now you can say there is a war, and we don't have to figure out here who is at fault uh, for that uh, several stage war, which even perhaps in some ways continues to this day. India had uh, 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 similar uh, uh, tensions, at least grave enough tensions. Uh, uh, at the time. And, and the British role in neither place was helpful in terms of resolving, uh, uh, resolving uh, those tensions. And yet, uh, the two directions are different. Uh, my topic, constitutionalism, the two, t the two states go in a very different direction with respect to constitutionalism. And with respect to inclusion, exclusion, which is related to constitutionalism, they are also, they are also different. And in this sense, I think uh, that's the that's the problem that that that's the you know the period when when everything could have been different. I mean, I think 1948, maybe the, uh, Oz and Omri, who know this much better, and the others will probably disagree. The die was already cast, perhaps in the Yeshuv, but in 48, I think uh, it could have gone differently. It could have gone differently, and and socialism. I agree with uh, what Oz says about, uh, about the historical background, uh, the very early versions. But by 1948, socialism was anti-colonial everywhere in the world. I think, you know, one can say... Uh, not, in, not in France. Uh, uh, the, the well, uh, you're right. There's a division in France uh, between the Communist Party and the Socialists, well, the Socialists split in the middle. but. But still, uh, uh, the majority of, uh, I mean, in this respect, ask yourself the question of why does the Soviet Union support uh, both of these decolonization efforts? Why do you get uh, Czech uh, uh, machine guns uh, in this early stage? Now, is it really just, uh, uh, you know, geopolitics, which probably it is in part, it is also, uh, you know, Leninism is anti-colonial. Leninism, Leninism uh, and it fosters uh, anti-colonial uh, uh, movements. Whatever the Soviet, however much the Soviet Union becomes an empire and a, a new kind of colonist or an old kind uh, surviving in the 20th century, uh, the ideology 
and its international links are, generally speaking, anti-colonial. I mean, uh, Soviet, uh, 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 the Soviet Union has a very different relationship to the third world liberation movements, so-called. Uh, Let me say something about the Indian comparison, which I think is very interesting. First, yeah. you probably remember him. We had a colleague here, Faisal Devshi, who wrote a book about yes, Pakistan, yes. Pakistan as a phenomenon similar to Zionism. It's a religion that became nationalism, as far as he's concerned. He actually created some kind of a parallel or comparison, not between Zionism and Indian nationalism, but between Zionism and Pakistani nationalism after the partition. And also, uh, Ben Gurion, who never, uh, as a prime minister, ever stepped into a synagogue uh, towards the end of his life, the ten last year of his life, was really preoccupied with Buddhism. Uh, he studied the topic, he saw some affinity with Buddhism, both on the level of, sort of morality and, and socialism. It, it was a huge preoccupation for him. He started with Spinoza. This must be the reason Spinoza. why he ended up with Spinoza. <laughs> he did start with Spinoza. Right, right, right. right. Okay. I wanted to um, uh, continue on the connection between socialism and Zionism, uh, and, and nationalism, sorry, that uh, Andrew also mentioned, that I think, you know, that two um, interesting historical moments to mention in that sense, uh, to, that kind of underpin the same argument, I'd say. Um, the first that in the 70s, um, as Oz mentioned, as the welfare state, the Israeli welfare state expanded and became more inclusive to the parts of the population that were previously um, excluded from it, namely the Mizrahim and lower classes. So that, I think, is a moment where the, so the Zionist socialism is able to um, to be less exclusionary, right? And to actually... Um, um, care for more parts of the population, but still remain in the in within the Jewish nationality. Uh, just a, an expanded notion of who is worthy to be part of that uh, nationality. Um, but the second moment, and I think that's an interesting, uh, you know, there's the relationship between Israeli liberalism and and Israeli socialism, and really. Um, the the you know the moment where nationalism in Israel is expanded um, or is um, in the 90s with the rise of liberalism these are one of the moments that uh, true civic um, equality can gain grounds and that actually happens with the fall of socialism and with the rise of liberalism and other you know, other moments in history where um, the where uh, equality in Israel gains grounds beyond the Jewish national na nation is due to the more liberal elements of of the states, like the Supreme Court, which has been uh, kind of one of the liberal bastions from the beginning, um, and definitely in the 90s, as I mentioned, where. Um, again, the Supreme Court um, kind of mandates a few um, important moments of, um, of civic equality. Uh, now, I'm not saying that to kind of throw away the socialist history, um, and I think it has a big important uh, role in, um, of course, the current, you know, in, in building the um, important education, health, and other kind of public systems of Israel. Um, but just that connection between the liberal strand and the fact that that was one of the only moments that were able to go beyond uh, national exclusion, I think, is an interesting, interesting uh, point to, to think about. Yeah, us. Yeah, I, I think it's interesting. In the 1950s, I think Israel was egalitarian economically and, and uh, uh, very hierarchical, hierarchical and, and, and exclusionary socially. And I think by the 21st century, it just flipped. So socially, I think different segments of Israeli society have actually much better access now to politics, to the public sphere, to culture. Uh, but this is with uh, rampant uh, neoliberal capitalism uh, and a strong differentiation in the marketplace. Uh, 
I think that's also, the trend. I'm sorry, I mean, sorry for being such a nutnik. In the 50s, Arabs were still under a military regime also with the Absolutely. Soviet, I'm, I'm talking period. about the Jewish population. I mean, that's, uh, no, no, I know, but I mean, the, the, the extent to which we tolerate, I'm not saying that you tolerate, I'm saying that when we look at something as egalitarian, say, um, it really is egalitarian for Jews. Uh, I, I, ac I accept I have no doubt that you accept it. But See, I'm, just, this is, I'm, I'm writing now a book about Israel in the 1960s, and I feel constantly the need to write the Jewish, I mean, the Jewish population of Israel. At some point, you can't really repeat it endlessly. No. Um, Another problem uh, firsthand, yeah, yeah. Right. Um, again, you, you have to take it for granted um, after you clarified your basic position. But I have, can I add something to your question, Ben? Like, I agree with your analysis, and I think, though, that that the reason why you did, like, you know, like, civil liberties is because it has so much limitation, and we see it today, we see it, just to think about, like, you know, classic socialism, like, the welfare of the, of workers, of like good condition of labor, who is the worker, you know, who is like allowed to. Since the 90s, when Israel was also opening to neoliberalism, like to liberalism, then neoliberalism, we started to get, uh, how we say that in English, like uh, immigrants who are labor immigrants. And since we had that moment in which like Palestinians from Gaza and Palestinians from the West Bank used to work in Israel, and then like the borders became more closed. So it's like, that moment of civil liberties is also the moment in which labor conditions is actually worsening and we see it up until today in which unionizing is like crushed completely when it's so hard to create like decent condition of labor for Israel. We see how now the government of Israel is treating the entire huge like sector of, of teachers. It's like a huge amount of the, of the Israeli society and like the, in a moment everybody after the corona started like in a moment the entire uh, teachers, like a uh, population of teachers in Israel became to a vacation without, without payment, like that. Before, like we had, before everything was happening, the, the first sector that decided to drop. So it's very interesting to think that we do have like those imaginary, I don't know, like civil liberties, but it's not actually the condition for what socialism is actually trying to create, equality, good wage, good like labor condition, good contracts, like are the worst. For yeah. also Palestinians and Israelis, like Jewish Israelis, like for everyone, it's basically just like, you know, benefiting the one or like people are extremely, extremely like privileged. Or that's the, the quality of liberalism is the quality in the market. Uh, so it's a form of equality that depends on your chances uh, in the market. Yeah. But, you know, there are, I would say, and even in your remark, Ben, uh, two dimensions of liberalism uh, were, were mentioned. You said that's the period of the constitutional revolution, and that also is the period of the universalization of, of welfare, the replacement of the histadrut type exclusionary version by a national system. I don't know, are Arabs part of the healthcare system uh, as a result of those reforms, Arab citizens of Israel? I think they are. Yes. So perhaps in that respect, there was a genuine universalization. But that is the level of rights. Uh, there's also the level of the, of the dismantling of the statism of Israeli society, right? Because from what everything I'm reading now, together Histadrut and the state uh, controlled uh, half the means of production and influenced the credit system for the rest. So it was a highly statized economy, right? And there, that too has been, if not exactly dismantled, been transformed. And I think that it's important to stress that in the very same period when this happens, uh, people use this term, today it looks absurd, but somehow uh, it was right at the time. There's also a process of decolonization, right? Uh, right. It has another name. I'm, I'm taking the joke from Yoav and, uh, and Gershom, uh, it was called the peace process. Right. But the peace process, to understand it properly, given that the nature of this uh, complex uh, entity, uh, Israel and the occupied territories, is uh, a decolonization process also. And combination of economic, political, 
liberalism with a supposed decolonization process represented, I think that's why Ben, who is usually not so positive about uh, Israeli periods, that's the reason why you can talk about that period as positive. And if, now, if you look at it now, when you can certainly not say anymore that the decolonization process is continuing, it has come to an end, if not with the killing of Rabin, uh, then uh, uh, after Perez has abandoned it pretty much, uh, uh, and then of course all the Netanyahu uh, uh, victories and all the rest meant that, uh, I mean, no, very few people outside of Israel now take it very seriously. And, and I think that the, uh, the situation, certainly as you watch uh, the current uh, uh, problems of Israeli parliamentarism, the civil part of liberalism too has been severely damaged. So all you have now is the neoliberal version, which, is, which continues, that is not challenged. The society economy is not being restatized. So of three dimensions of change, which I think one can associate with the, with let's say the 70s uh, above all, that's the period when the three together are the most important. Uh, well, those three dimensions of change, only one continues. And that's, I think, is, a, is the problem. So in that sense, uh, we need not say that liberalism is preferable to, to the socialist early period, so-called socialist, which is exclusionary to its core, but we can see the three processes together represented potential progress. Yeah, I mean, just on this, on this topic of the kind of like intertwinement of um, the, the occupation of the Palestinian territories and uh, the shifting, the shifts in Israel's economy, like um, I, one of the things that I heard over and over again when I was on an activist delegation to Palestine a couple of years ago um, was that uh, the Israeli state learned from uh, the example of South Africa, where in South Africa, white capital was dependent upon black labor. And that like up until, um, you know, up through like the early 90s, uh, Israeli capital was dependent upon Palestinian labor, but by opening up, uh, and like Maya said, um, allowing for, and this is, I'm sure it's like oversimplified, but like opening up uh, Israel to economic migrants and then uh, sort of cutting off Palestinians has made, is, has made the Israeli economy no longer dependent on, upon Palestinian labor to the extent that it previously was. Um, so just I just want to say that this um, sounds to me very, I don't know the facts, I don't know if someone here does, but this sounds extremely plausible and important, um, um, probably just true and uh, important, the comment. So it's, it's, it's moving from one form of exploitation to another form of exploitation. So in Israeli agriculture, for instance, there are many uh, guest workers from Thailand uh, and caregivers for old people are uh, invariably known as Filipinos. Uh, many of them come from the Philippines, but others from other countries. So, um, and we see, you, you walk in the Israeli street today, you, you see them. Uh, they're, they're very, very, very visible. Uh, when we talk about, I think, uh, political news from Israel are bleak, and I'm very pessimistic about the future of all of that. Uh, but in terms of uh, decolonization, we also should think about the Mizrahi Jews and, and their decolonization that has been a long process. Um, the other thing that is interesting, and I don't want to be too optimistic about that, is the way that uh, um, uh, Arab citizens of Israel uh, have become more integrated into Israeli society. Uh, and there are m many indications of that. And one of the indications is this party that, that Omri mentioned before. I mean, I think many people of our background see in this party that it is predominantly an Arab party, uh, our political home. Uh, and that by itself is a sort of integration. For the first time, right? right? First time, the idea that there should be a Jewish Arab party 
Well, there, there is a long history of Jewish yeah. Arab parties. The Communist uh, Party was the wrong one. Jewish yeah, it's a socialist, Arab. a real socialist party was a, a Jewish Arab party as opposed well, it was to the Labour It was not a real, I mean, it's, come on. I mean, it was a party that had uh, Arab voters and Jewish leaders, and the, the, the leaders were Jewish because Moscow made this decision. Also, uh, we agree about the facts, but, the, uh, but, uh, but, but it's, I think, um, for this class, for this discussion, it's, mm -hmm. it's extremely, extremely important to notice that uh, precisely this difference. So the part, that part was um, absolutely not perfect, far from it, and not a real Jewish, Arab, it's, it's not a real Jewish Arab collaboration, but the fact that when liberal Zionism, um, um, sorry, labor Zionism rather, mm -hmm. And liberal Zionism has, I think we can agree, completely disappeared, finally completely disappeared. At least I've been waiting for a long time. It finally happened um, that uh, it's no longer represented in parliament. Um, in that moment, you still have the, the first uh, beginnings of some kind of a tradition, which was never perfect, of Arab-Jewish uh, collaboration in a truly socialist party. Um, uh, nothing of what I'm saying is exactly true. It was never really, you know, it's like the Holy Roman Empire, which is not holy, not Roman, and not an empire. Uh, it's not real Arab-Jewish collaboration. It's not, I don't know, socialism, at least, as I would like to embrace it and so forth. But that tradition remains now. And it's interesting to notice, for example, I think, I think you will agree that uh, we have a huge, interesting political question uh, lying ahead of us. I, I'm not sure that it's not going to be overlooked. It is, how do we now understand Arab-Jewish collaboration in Israel? Because this party is going to take over the Israeli left um, uh, in some form, but it's not clear what it, what it should look like. It's not clear what's going to be its political agenda and, and so forth. Here's a question. Since the question, I think, is going to be, for example, if this is de facto somehow grounded in Hadash, in this uh, socialist uh, party, one way or another, how do we understand this uh, um, new agenda that ha will have to emerge? Is this collaboration going to be still explicitly socialist or not? That's an interesting question. Um, and so forth. Well, I have an even more universal question is whether socialism as such is the right way of thinking about the future of leftist politics to begin with. Uh, we see it's the, and, and, and the kind of uh, burden this put on labor and the value of labor, uh, whether that's actually sort of still valid as a way to mobilize uh, the, you know, the, the marginalized uh, and think about the future of uh, progressive politics. I'm, I'm, I'm not sure at all. I agree. I personally agree. But uh, I think it, it needs to have some room. Um, in the conversation, it's to be on the left. If it's going to be socialist, I yeah, yeah. I, mean, I, th I think that we all agree on that. I always have this uh, this question in mind, even through this uh, long and interesting seminar. Is that is this the right term? Is this the right category? Is the is this the right uh, form of motivation, especially uh, when uh, people out there, you know, younger people, uh, well, some of the students are that, are that age, uh, uh, are interested in, you know, they call it the Green New Deal, e ecology becomes central, obviously, uh, movements uh, against various forms of gender exclusion are pretty central to a lot of people, and, and lots of places, race and ethnicity, too, uh, play this role. So, so are these things... Uh, can they, is socialism a relevant part of all that, or is it a possible umbrella? These questions, I think, uh, uh, really, uh, really remain. But in any case, Bernie Sanders, I think if it had not been for him, we probably wouldn't have this because he has put it on the agenda. And it looks like the very same younger people who I just referred to, to them, it's not a dirty word. To them, it's a positive concept and certainly are willing to think about it again, although not necessarily in terms of, uh, of thinking through what it might mean. In our, the, one of the purposes of this seminar, unfortunately, it's not uh, for mass consumption, is to try to, in fact, raise the, this issue in such a way that people 
people can uh, can uh, learn from it. But of course, the Israeli discussion of Israel-Palestine uh, is not necessarily the way to uh, uh, not necessarily the way to rehabilitate the concept because there are other problems which appear so much greater and so much more so much more serious. And I would say uh, religion, because you mentioned the joint list, but even the joint list has components which are really fundamentalist. Uh, and so in that sense, uh, you know, Hadash is, used to be the Communist Party or used to be a Communist Party, uh, but still there are partners within that which are religious. And in that sense, uh, uh, you know, the relationship of secular people like many of us here uh, to religion uh, may be a very important topic today, which is, which is really uh, a topic of the day. Uh, I wanted to raise a question because I think uh, 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 we, uh, Oz is a historian and, uh, and a lot of us have history uh, training. Uh, it's a historical question. Uh, in, in the other class, the other seminar, uh, which, uh, which is on historical sociology, I, I dealt with theories of imperialism uh, basically this week, and we will stay with something like that also for, for next week. Uh, there are uh, obviously people uh, who, uh, who put uh, Israeli or the history of the uh, Palestine-Israel uh, in bring it to relationship to, uh, to socialism, but it is certainly has a significant relationship with colonialism. Mm -hmm. uh, but what kind of colonialism was it? I mean, uh, uh, certainly, uh, if we stay with the socialists, uh, uh, you know, Hilferding, Luxembourg, uh, uh, Lenin, Hobbes, and Mid, they're the main authors uh, within the socialist tradition of what the new imperialism is, uh, would very much focus on, on econ economic motivations for expansion. Uh, now, how do you, how does one explain, I mean, first and foremost, uh, uh, the process of colonization and settlement. But I think one should also pay a little attention uh, to, to the British interest in all this. Why did the Brits occupy? Uh, I mean, uh, obviously, it's supposed, supposed to be a mandate and it was supposed to be preparation for, for a future of non-colonial status. But they dealt with it as a, as a colonial framework. What is their interest? And does the economic dimension explain uh, the Jewish interest uh, in, uh, in the colonization of this place, which in many respects uh, was not going to be a very hospitable one for, for economic development? Well, we need another three hours for this discussion. Well, why not? No, just open. Uh, my feeling, my feeling I, uh, I do not know much about this and we really probably need even, yeah at least three hours, but um, one interesting, maybe for me, comment, and I, I, it would be interesting to see what others think about it, that I often um, assume that there is a big distinction between the uh, colonization um, in the, uh, well, before the establishment of the state and after the, the, the establishment of the state and the, and the settlers movement, because the settlers are uh, also colonizers in the economic, uh, um, in the economic mm -hmm. sense, right? They have clear economic interests. Right, uh, and uh, they're in a way much more classic, despite being religious Zionists and so forth. They have real economic interests, and uh, uh, and it's possible that earlier on, um, interests were different. So um, I, I think the it's it's a complicated question. I think the it is a part of the what colonizing uh, process or movement, but it has uh, obviously sui generis features Zionism. Uh, and there are two issues here is the way Zionism politically aligned itself with colonialism for its own purposes. So it began with the way that uh, Herzl tried to um, uh, get the involvement of the Kaiser, uh, helping him, uh, you know, substantiate uh, Zionism in Palestine. And then the British turn in the 19 teens. And uh, Israeli geography for many decades saw itself as anti-British and anti-colonial, but Israel, I mean, Zionism was an arm of British uh, colonialism, uh, politically, uh, throughout uh, this period until 1945. So there were three years in which Zionism fought against British colonialism, but the previous 30 years were very, very different. 
And, and then there are dynamics on the ground that resemble the colonial experience. Uh, you know, the first settlements, the Moshavot employed um, many Arabs and the relationship were not terribly different than the relationship between the Australian whites and Aboriginals and so on and so forth. So you, you, you see the um, uh, colonialism appears in different aspects of this uh, historical phenomenon. And then again, there are uh, dimensions of that that are very, very different. Um, so until 1948, all land that was uh, occupied and tilled by, by, tilled by, uh, by Zionists was uh, privately owned. It was not part of a state project. Uh, that changed significantly after 1948, obviously. And, and, and I agree with Omri. I think with the settler movement after 1967, you see people moving to the West Bank uh, because it's cheaper. Uh, and they get all kinds of financial uh, privileges because of that. Um, in a way, it becomes closer to the colonial uh, uh, experience. Yeah, I mean, in a in a weird way, it's a throwback on 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 earlier forms of uh, of imperialism, uh, when settlement was a significant factor. I mean, after all, uh, there is Spanish settlement in the Americas, there is Portuguese settlement in Brazil. There is obviously English, French, especially English settlement in several places, but even French settlement existed. So settler colonies exist. Uh, the new imperialism, uh, as it is described by everyone, is not about that. It begins 1890s right. or, 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 or something like that. And it is, it is occupation. Occupation is a significant part of it because the economic penetration is not secure without political military presence but but not so many settlers uh, of course there is always some settlement uh, uh, oh. everywhere but it is not the not the main point whereas this version is is from the outset settlement related be supposed to move there right be oh. supposed to move enormous number of people there i don't mean now settlers in the sense of the settlements now in the west bank but settlement in terms of bringing in establishing colonies like First, the Greeks were the ones who, who invented this right, version right. of colonialism, right? It's very old, of putting our people uh, who are superfluous from some point of view or homeless from some other point of view in another place. And this, I think, is, is part of the ideology. And it becomes, in fact, in terms of these various aliyahs, part of the history, right. too. People are brought over. Hitler helped a lot in terms of the numbers, uh, right? But still, that's, that's the, this, is, this is one feature of it. And, and then, you know, as I'm reading now, at the same time, you notice that there are attempts to establish plantations. There are private investors who do, it, who do want to establish uh, uh, economic forms. And they're the ones who use Arab labor. Because from their point of view, Arab labor is better uh, as long as it is much cheaper and perhaps even more expert and trained. Uh, so there is another thing happening simultaneously, but it's not significant within the overall picture of this. So it looks like modern colonialism or modern imperialism coexisting with, with a much more significant throwback to an earlier, earlier version. And in this sense, uh, you can say, of course, the American uh, British colonists, or not just British, but European, are settlers, and they have a relationship to indigenous people, but they see themselves as decolonizing. Uh, you say they're only five years when they battled the British colonial power, but I'm sure there oh, were yes. significant tensions before, and, uh, and jurisdictional conflicts, and, and, and political issues, I mean, obviously, uh, 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 to uh, uh, to the Jewish settlers, the idea of, of being under British rule forever was not attractive. And okay. in the end, there is a decolonizing. It's a colonizing, but also decolonizing. That, that's, by the way, the American that's story as well. I mean, these are colonizers. The American story as well. Then decolonize themselves. They also rebel against uh, British exactly. imperialism. And the Canadians too, because we don't realize, but they had several important rebellions also against the Brits. Well, so it, this is part of the, 
it's the story of Jefferson, the story of Gandhi. I mean, these individuals were identified with British imperialism at the beginning of their career, right. then turned exactly. against it. Yeah, Gandhi's role in South Africa. Right, absolutely. Not anti-colonial at all. No, no, he was proud to be a member of the British Empire. Right, right. So in this sense, I think, you know, one has to be, uh, you know, uh, you know, it's, it's, when we make socialism uh, to be just an ideological superstructure or justification for colonialism, uh, uh, we go wrong a lot of ways. And I think, as you explained uh, from your point of view, why that is wrong and why that is over simple and so on. But I think we should understand this colonialism too, because it is not, a, not just a simple matter of theft of land and dispossession, which of course inv was involved, but it is, it is something else than that as well. Well, at the end of the 9th century, colonialism was considered to be progressive, and there were other schemes. Just to remind you, there was a, a baron, a philanthropist, Hirsch, who settled Jews in Argentina, also in colonies. That was also a sort of some kind of a solution to the quote-unquote Jewish question that was asked again and again to, throughout the 19th century. Okay, well, anybody? Maya? Yeah, Maya, you have your hand, yeah. I wanted to add, Andrew, that I definitely don't think the question of which kind of colonialism Israel is, or if we see it as like a specific contingency or like a continuum and like, because I think Israel is similar to many different models of colonialism throughout its time and it has different features and also like what Oz was saying, unique characteristics. But I think it is important to, that, the land grabbing and the disposition of population and the changing of the structure of labor or like ownership means of productions and and that thing is is not just there is a moment in which it's like moving from private into a state systematic uh, operation like the 47 48 war which is in the israeli name the independence war and in the arab like in the arabic languages like the crisis the nakba so it's like this is a moment in which things are not any longer based on you know, individuals or collectives or like uh, the barons or like Rothschild people who are like has the means. It is becoming a systematic. So in which, in this sense, I do think Israel fall under like what it means to have a settled colony because it is becoming a system in which land is being dispossessed. New people are coming to sit on that land, to walk that land, and people are basically deprived of their relationship to that land and the labor that you can expropriate from that territory. And I don't know, like, has I studied a whole, a whole semester with Benoit, like a few years ago, about settler colonialism? There's many answers to this question, but settler colonialism as an idea in its core is that it's a structure and not an event. So it's not one thing that happens once, like 47, 48. It's a system of, of relationship and mechanism that continues to operate. So that's how Israel is like, it's constantly changing, and yet something in its core that Jews are superiorly higher to other people that live in that land historically and like contemporary, that's a mechanism, that's a structure that operates. Like, so I do think it fits to that model more than others. Um, that's uh, what I wanted to add to this. I want to add, uh, I think everything Maya said is uh, right, but um, um, I really do quite like that. I think it's just right, but, um, but, while we were talking, also when I think Ben was making some of his comments, when, when Oz continued them, I, I came to realize that there is something in me that's actually willing also to be slightly uh, gentler on the um, um, socialist Zionist nuances. Um, and um, I realized that there are examples, and I think that we can, we can see them and admit them. And I think it would be politically also wise to admit them that um, there were real socialist institutions in Israel that when they functioned, um, and, and mind you, I'm not saying democratic or whatever, I'm saying, for example, socialist, that when they functioned, um, you could see and can see in them um, uh, the first underpinnings of actually a different type of relation between, say, Jews and Arabs, um, um, elitist Jews and Mizrahis, whatever, however you want to cut it. Here is one example, and in a way, I know I'm aware of the cliche, but I think the cliche is not completely false. Um, uh, the health system in Israel. You know, I think anybody who grow, grows up in Israel 
um, um, hardly sees Arabs um, uh, before they go to the military. I grew up personally in the Galilee and I still almost did not see Arabs. And um, um, when you get sick and you go to a hospital, you suddenly discover the meaning of a public and not just public, socialist uh, system that functions, uh, in fact, beautifully. You know, again, the cliche is about the Arab doctors, but it's not just the Arab doctors. It's the Arab doctors and it's the Arab patients. And, the, you know, it's um, a certain um, moment in which you realize what a state, what a real socialist state could have looked like. Um, what I'm trying to say is not that, um, as I think you by now realize, uh, I'm not a big believer in the idea of a Jewish state. I don't think that, um, it is a way of thinking that, as Andrew suggested, in 48, the Jewish state could have still been socialist or something like that. But I do think that some socialist institutions could be looked upon as um, Wittgenstein's ladder. Certain institutions that you can climb um, and then move on beyond um, the Jewish state. You see real... Um, collaboration, you see real uh, equality being at least possible. It can be imagined once you look at those socialist institutions in, in Israel, and they exist. So um, it's a much more dialectical, um, could have been a much more dialectical process. I think we agree that this is not right now, the dialectics is not working uh, towards uh, um, this type of uh, positive solution. Um, but it could be it could be detected that it actually existed in some way. I know I lost Maya, but uh, well, well, I just be just uh, to uh, to correct one uh, possible mis mis misimpression. Forty eight. I didn't think that the the chances were for a socialist. I don't know what it would have meant anyhow in terms of uh, of historical models. Uh, uh, I think that. Uh, uh, there were lots of different things that could have become, and one, for example, um, much more constitutional from the outset, so you're not in a position where it takes a court to try to introduce constitutionalism into a setting uh, uh, in the face of resistance of the other branches of power. So a lot of chances, and a lot of things are missed then, and certainly uh, uh, a, a constitution could have uh, and perhaps this is the reason why it was never uh, uh, produced, it could have created uh, different chances for exclusion, inclusion, or rather the inclusion of the Arab population in the political system. I mean, uh, whether you needed to have military rule until the mid 1960s in Arab majority territories is to me really, uh, 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 is really, uh, very, very hard to understand and very hard to uh, uh, to see. So I think there were, uh, you know, there were chances. And I'm just comparing it to India, which certainly didn't become socialist by most standards uh, in 1948, but it became a country where uh, uh, where liberal democracy was institutionalized much more securely than at any moment of uh, of Israeli history, uh, and that's in spite of the fact that the the, uh, the the social division and the conflicts were at least as grave, if not in many respects, uh, many respects graver. So there is a real responsibility. And interestingly enough, uh, there was disagreement around these uh, topics back in 48. It wasn't as if Ben-Gurion uh, was the only one whose views mattered. It's just that he did win. Uh, and, and I think with very unfortunate uh, very unfortunate consequences. But yeah, I mean, this might have been, it might have been much too late given the prehistory and given the geography and given, uh, uh, I mean, after all, the Hindu part of India is so powerful uh, that Nehru and the Hindus could afford to be uh, much more tolerant, one could say, than uh, uh, Israel in the, in the Arab, middle of the Arab world. Uh, uh, so but, in that sense, uh, you know, but Andrew, mil million of Muslims died during the partition, and look what what's going on in India today. Modi yeah, and Bibi Netanyahu are not, brothers in arms. That's right. That today is, is true, and millions of Hindus and Muslims died in the oh. uh, uh, during the period of the uh, 
of the population exchanges. So it was horrible. But nevertheless, uh, uh, a, a state emerged from it, which was not exclusionary the same way that the, that the Israeli, Israeli state was after 48. Uh, it, it's not, it wasn't ideal. And it had a period of, uh, of uh, a dictatorship also during the emergency of Mrs. Gandhi. So it had other uh, mm -hmm. options. But still, uh, uh, in that respect, uh, 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 you know, uh, uh, it showed another possibility. And, and of course, it's not, these are two such different countries and two such different settings that there's no point in really insisting on that too much. But also to say there are no choices in 48, after all, the idea of a binational or a federated uh, uh, outcome was not absent, even uh, in, in Jewish opinion. One question I was going to ask from all of you, and, uh, and no one addressed this, what would this history look like from an Arab point of view? In other words, uh, the first period of colonization, what would it look like from point of view of, let's say, uh, you know, uh, we could read Rashid Khalidi. We can read someone who actually tried to write about it from basically a left-wing point of view and not from an Islam, Islamic uh, 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 particularist uh, uh, perspective. Uh, but how would one evaluate uh, uh, this history uh, from the point of view of, uh, uh, of, uh, uh, of Arab uh, intellectuals or Arab political activists? Or, uh, uh, or even uh, political movements, although I think uh, 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 certainly uh, it's not a very hard question to answer for the PLO and for its various uh, uh, sub-organizations. But still, there is a, obviously a question of, uh, uh, you know, for example, what we see as a, uh, as, as uh, dimensions of socialism in the pre-state Palestine uh, 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 geography, uh, what do they look like to 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 uh, to Arabs? Did they? Uh, did anyone imagine uh, the possibility of uh, of collaboration? Uh, I I don't even know the answer to the question of federalism, because I know that on the Jewish side, uh, there were significant intellectuals, if not movements, which were interested in binational or federal or uh, 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 in some respect, cooperative solutions of the, of the problem of the region. But was there anything like this on the Arab side? And if not, why not? I think uh, I don't have a good solution for you because I'm also a product of the Israeli school, you know, like education system and like indoctrination, like which is basically Zionism from its core. So I just can say something interesting that this year I took a class with Aaron Jakes in history in the fall semester and we learned about um, the 36-39 Arab revolt uh, in Palestine. And I remember learning it about it in high school as part of you know, history as, as basically a revolt, as a preparation to a larger revolt between Arab and Jews in Israel. But when we read that book that we read, it was actually a revolt within the Arab society between working class Palestinian and elite Palestinians, people who walk the land and own the land. And that, you know, that kind of um, non-monolithic or like more uh, nuanced, um, you know, understanding of, of, of class, is like uh, about the society of the Palestinian society is a, not just one unit, one monolithic Palestinian society is an actually society with many inter, um, you know, clashes, let's say, especially based on class and between also rural communities and urban communities, then it was very interesting to understand it like that. It's just something that is very hard to see from someone who is, I'm up until today, I feel that I just don't know enough about that, you know, strand of history and also that uh, position, that, you know, like viewpoint, that perspective, because we don't study that so much and I don't study it here in sociology so much. So it's just like, I just think we're lacking on that. I feel I'm lacking on that point. 
Andrew, I, I think it would be wrong for us to answer this question. Uh, okay, well, uh, that's I would, fine. I, I, would, I, would, I would just say the following is that before 48, there were on the, on the local level and among individuals where the movements or leaders, there was a lot of collaboration. There were joint businesses, Arab Jewish businesses in places like Jaffa or Jerusalem. Um, and uh, I think the turning point in the history of Zionism and the Arab-Israeli question is 1929. That's a book that came out a few years ago and showed that the, um, uh, the conflict was militarized in 1929 uh, because of a series of riots and, and a famous massacre in Hebron that took place in 1929. So from an Arab point of view, to the degree that I can uh, talk about our point of view. Before 1929, there was a difference between Jews and Zionists. So the all Jewish communities in places like Hebron or Jerusalem were treated differently, even by Arab nationalists, until 1929, where they were equated and became one kind of an enemy. Uh, but as the conflict became more militarized, 1929, then 1936, and then 1945, and then 1948, again, on the local level, there was, you know, my other grandfather grew up in Gadara, which in a different political environment, in which this was a late 19th century settlement that was very close to an Arab uh, village, uh, Katra. And, uh, you know, uh, farmers employed Arab, uh, Arab uh, workers. Uh, my, my grandfather spoke fluent Arabic. My father was born in 1927, did not. So, because by the time he became sort of an adult, the, this connection was entirely severed. My father, and that's also a colonial situation, and please don't tell Anne Stoller, but my father had uh, a, a, a Palestinian wet wetness nurse from Katra. And so, uh, again, it's a colonial situation. Our workers, our witness, uh, but there's a kind of intimacy and proximity uh, and also some cultural exchange. I mean, the knowledge of uh, language and so on and so forth that was all gone after 1948. We, well, we you, grew up in a society. But, but you did answer it, and I think it's actually, it's, it's actually very, very interesting what you said. Because this is that's really what I was uh, was wondering about. I was wondering about. I mean, you know, uh, uh, after all, uh, uh, you know, uh, living so close by and having uh, probably uh, various kinds of relations uh, uh, contained other possibilities. Contained other possibilities. Anyhow, it's not. We could have Benoit Chayond, uh, who has written a book on Palestinian civil society. Uh, and try to uh, answer answer that question, but I think uh, you know you you really uh, and I, I have read Rashid Khalidi and uh, uh, and a couple of others. So uh, in a way, I'm I'm trying just trying to recollect of what their attitude is of what could have been done on our side. Uh, I mean, of course, one thing which I'm always amazed by is is the rejection of the Peel of the Peel uh, Commission's uh, partition plan on the Arab side. You know, from retrospect, which is also hindsight is 2020, you kind of look at uh, the very small Jewish part of the Peel proposal and the fact that most of Palestine would be left uh, uh, in uh, Arab hands. And you would say, when was a deal like that ever going to appear uh, historically? And of course, some people even do this with Camp David, right? They say, how could he reject the Camp David uh, compromise, which is so much better. Uh, imagine today Camp David being proposed by the Israeli uh, ruling uh, circles. So, so in a way, uh, there is this history, but this I think is a very unfair way of looking at it. It's not, it's not fair because under the circumstances, uh, the deal that looks very good 40 years later may not have looked like a fantastic deal for the participants, those who would be moved because there were population transfers involved in it from the outset. So I think rejecting those kinds of colonialist uh, arrangements uh, was something that uh, one can justify even many, many years later. But still, uh, uh, you know, hi history has more possibilities than the ones which are realized. And I was wondering about what else would have been possible. And perhaps 
that's what has to be talked about again. I think to some extent, Omri, that's what you're doing in your book, because to the extent that I know the manuscript, I only know some parts of it. Uh, your question of what kind of reconstruction would be possible is also based on earlier alternatives that have been raised. So it's not just you're trying to imagine something completely new and utopian, you're trying to imagine things which others have imagined before. And if they imagined it, it could not have been impossible. And I think that this is what, uh, what you would need, probably not just in Israel proper, but the West Bank, and even in some Arab countries uh, for, for real change. Well, I definitely think so, yeah. But it is utopian. Well, it's not utopian. It's not utopian, like, but it's far But the reality is untenable Yeah. at the same time, right? The reality is untenable, and it's going to be untenable uh, for, uh, and that's it's significant. It's going to be untenable for countries which are friendly to Israel, many, and it's going to be untenable for a significant part of the Jewish population within Israel. And I would say even untenable for the American Jewish community, which is, uh, uh, has a generational split within it, very, very significant generational split on questions like this. So even though the future is utopian, the future we would imagine is utopian, the present is increasingly untenable. We have a situation in which there's a new government, uh, Netanyahu and Gantz, and one of the first items uh, on the agenda is annexation. Yes. Uh, yes. But, but that's, uh, uh, although, you know, you, it has its friends in the American political uh, order, uh, it has no friends anywhere else in the world, right? And so this is, uh, yeah, of course you could imagine a future which is in the short term much more horrible than anything in the present but is that tenable uh, well can... Andrew, if, if one thing has been um, revealed in the last years is that the no friends in the world is becoming increasingly less relevant since you know the theory of um, diplomatic isolation and no one will allow israel to do such and such uh, has become, you know, it has not materialized. And the, the foreign, the trade, Israel trade relations are just getting stronger and stronger uh, with, with the East, you know, with China, with India, with other places, or even with Europe that are just, they don't, let's say, put their money when, where their mouth is. Um, higher, you know, same chances with the upcoming annexation, I'd say. Right, look, look what happened now. Expulsion. It will end in, with expulsion and the world will let us. But look, maybe this is not the topic of this seminar. Yeah. Look what happened after the, uh, you know, Trump uh, ad, uh, published his plan. I mean, the Egyptians supported, the Saudis supported, some Gulf states supported, Modi is going to support it. I mean, you, you no. are too optimistic, Andrew. No, 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 I'm not because uh, uh, the prediction that the future is going to be worse than the present uh, is when you're 75 years old like me, it's the easiest prediction to make is that it's going to be so much worse for you guys than it was even for me. But on the other hand, uh, this course has a, has a utopian premise, basically, right? The whole course, the whole seminar is a utopian premise because even though I began in a very... Uh, uh, you know, Catholic way about everyone that called themselves socialists should be taken seriously in one way or the other. The fact is that, uh, that you know, the people here and, uh, and lots of people who actually even listen to Bernie Sanders don't imagine that socialism is the Soviet Union again. Mm. We are imagining something utopian, maybe. The Green New Deal is a utopian, <clears throat> too. It's not as if... Uh, Socialism is the only one around. The Green New Deal is, uh, I mean, the likelihood that advanced industrial countries with the social interests that they now have will follow that kind of policy, which means ultimately radically limiting the, uh, the, 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 uh, the uh, speed of growth. Uh, uh, 
Well, maybe after this crisis of the, with the coronavirus, people will think differently. Uh, you know, we should not let even this crisis go to waste. Only because Corona will save us. Certainly, <laughs> there's an argument for socialism uh, after the coronavirus, right? Uh, if you look at uh, the way that the United States health system is handling this matter, or the United States government, then I think uh, the, the desire for something different might be, of course, it could be just the other way. Absolutely. It could go just the other way.